Good day. I'm Fran Burwell. I'm a distinguished fellow here at the Atlantic Council. And I'd like to welcome you all to uh, our panel on transatlantic green industrial policy, coordination, or competition. We have a super panel to talk about this. Um, and I hope we're going to have a really interesting discussion. Um, but I wanted first to put a couple of items on the table. And then can uh, talk about those as well. First, um, I think we throw the term industrial policy around a lot. And I think we need to consider a little bit what is industrial policy and do we know it when we see it? Um, my own definition is that it is when governments offer incentives, not necessarily financial incentives, but most frequently, um, and possibly penalties. Uh, to encourage companies and industries to make decisions that they would not otherwise make based purely on a business case. Uh, I think that we can have a, a good discussion about the differences between the US and the EU approach uh, here, and I'm looking forward to the panelists also chiming in on their views on what is industrial policy. I would say that having an energy system or a green energy system um, requires that the that that is resilient requires that the cost is cost is not the only determinant I think that's where we were in the past but not where we are now um, but how a country chooses to make that change is something that has an impact on its domestic economy but also with its international economic partners the second point I want to make is that the US and the EU are incredibly interdependent, both in trade and investment. Uh, over 60% of the foreign direct investment coming into this country comes from Europe. And the reverse is also true. About 60%, just over, of the foreign direct investment in Europe is from the United States. And I saw one figure that um, in the first three quarters of 2022, US companies invested $172 billion in Europe and only $7 billion in China. So that's not the way it's usually portrayed. But I think that when we uh, are talking about industrial policy, we're talking about a lot of companies that are operating in both markets, not only trading, but also investing. Um, and the final point that I wanted to make is that when you have that much business together, uh, you will have disagreements. This is inevitable. And uh, US trade policy, US EU trade policy is littered with uh, such disputes going back to, um, going back to bananas, uh, hormone beef, and GMOs, even though trade has grown quite significantly over the years. Um, so the question now before us, I think, is was the IRA, the US Inflation Reduction Act, was this an indication, another episode of these brief quarrels, sometimes they're not so brief if you look at Airbus Boeing, um, but was it, a, was it one of these episodic quarrels or is it an indication of a systemic issue that is arising as we both try to address the energy transition and the need to make our economies and particularly our energy systems more resilient? Um, to go deeper into this, I'm gonna briefly introduce our panel here. Uh, Miguel Guertetra is here with me in Washington, although he is the chief economist uh, for DG Energy at the European Commission, uh, and thus has a central spot in EU industrial policy. Um, Steve Smith is the group head of strategy for, the Nas for National Grid in the UK. Um, Sabina Skretich is on the board and the chief operating officer at ENA, uh, which also is a holding company that is part of PT, that has PPD, uh, Croatian company. Glad you could join us. And then from the Hungarian government, we have Ambassador Peter Zarate, who is the state secretary uh, for security policy at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Trade. Miguel, let me talk, turn to you first. Um, when the EU was confronted with the US IRA, um, there was a bit of tension in the air. I think it has resolved quite a bit or alleviated quite a bit, particularly after Presidents Biden and von der Leyen got together here in Washington. And we now have some uh, 
some processes mm -hmm. that we are going through uh, in terms of addressing those tensions. Um, but how did the EU, did the EU feel it was necessary to respond domestically, internationally? You put forward the Net Zero Industry Act and the Critical Raw Materials Act. Is that it? Um, do you see this as indicative of differences between the way the US and the EU will handle industrial policy? Well, thank you. Thank you very much for the opportunity uh, to address the audience and uh, discuss, uh, discuss about this, because I think it's the key topic that we will be discussing in the upcoming years. I mean, making the link uh, to, to what the previous uh, panel said and um, in the previous interventions, I think it's important to understand that you know, the energy crisis that we had uh, last year, in a sense, accelerated the need for the green transition, for the Green Deal, but not only for a reason of saving the planet, but because it is important for our affordability and it's important for our security of supply. I think energy policy is at the center of many discussions that we will have in the coming years. And the green transition is a massive structural change of our economies that we will have to manage uh, in a way. I mean, I think we need to start from the, from the big picture. I think it's very important that we cooperate so that there can be a healthy competition mm -hmm. based on rules. That is extremely important uh, because we have a lot to gain together. I don't think that it should be portrayed, I mean, this green transition as a zero-sum game. Uh, the cake can be bigger for all of us. We can have new markets, more innovation, <coughs> more products, but we need to set fair rules together. And I think that it's very important, and I'm, you know, I think the, you were alluding to President Biden and President von der Leyen uh, work together. Uh, I think it's very important that we work on a series of issues so that going forward with this transition, we can uh, you know, have a rule-based uh, approach. And I'm thinking about you know, cooperation on a cheap, stable access to commodities, openness of the markets to like-minded uh, countries, and, uh, and so on. There might be differences you know, in the approach between the EU and the US. This is normal. I mean, you know, in, the, in, the, in the IRA, there is you know, a strong uh, focus on, uh, on tax credits. On our side, there is a strong focus on targets, subsidies, you know, uh, regulatory approach. But what is important is, you know, uh, I believe, to focus on this big picture together going forward. Thank you. So let me just briefly follow up. And I want to invite um, our audience online to ask questions of the panelists as well. And we have a microphone over here um, that um, please, those of you who are here with us in DC, feel free to get up and, and uh, put forward a question. One brief follow up for you. You mentioned like-minded countries. There's been some discussion, um, not so much in the commission, but among member states about clubs. Do you see clubs as having a role here? How do you get from a bilateral US-EU to including Japan and, and others? OK, no, I think, I mean, this is, uh, we are probably at the start of this discussion because, I mean, the definition of what is a club, what would be, you know, the, the, the responsibilities and what would be the objectives, I mean, I don't think that we are yet there. But I believe that there is a discussion to, uh, to be had about ensuring that we have cheap and stable access, for instance, to commodities, to be able to do the transition in a way that doesn't drive you know, massive volatility, high uncertainty, very high cost of capital, that would make it much more difficult and it would take longer. So I think in that sense that it is very important, I mean, I don't know if it's you know, coalitions, clubs, but that the dialogue of like-minded countries about you know, conditions for demand, access, so that you know, this volatility that might happen, you know, in the market is well managed. Okay, good. Let me turn now to one of those like-minded countries um, and bring in Steve Smith uh, from the major utility. Um, and uh, Steve, let me ask you, where is the UK in all of this? What do you see as the industrial policy, if there is one of the government, um, moving forward for uh, an institution like National Grid, and what do you see as the right signals that you want to see to make a transition to green? And does it matter when you're thinking about how the US and the EU are having some differences 
not clear how significant or long-lasting those differences are, these teething problems. Where does the UK come into all this? So, so uh, I'll answer the question, and, and thank you for inviting me to join. Um, I, I suppose the first thing to say is just um, National Grid operates both sides of the Atlantic. So we are 50% um, in the US, US Northeast, and 50% in the UK. So we do sit, you know, both sides of this and, and see not just the UK angle, but also the, the, the US angle as well. Um, so, I mean, in some sense, and going back to, um, you know, what was said in the intro, I mean, we, we can't see this as, as zero sum. We're all on a collective journey. Um, solving climate change only works if everyone does it, and there's no benefit to any block or any club um, doing it faster than another. Um, so, I mean, to come back to your question, I mean, in the UK, based on your definition of industrial policy, we've had that for a long time in terms of greening our power generation, where... Um, you know, we've had, you know, government-backed contracts to get um, low and zero carbon generation built, which have been increasing in scale and ambition for a number of years. The, the things they, they haven't had to date is any rules of origin or rules of production. So they've simply been contracts to say, if you build it, but it doesn't require you to, you know, have any of the materials or, or labour, you know, um, in the UK. I think more generally in UK policy, I think we are sat there looking at what's going on both, you know, in the US and the um, EU. And I think, you know, the political discussions are now starting about whether we need to go beyond that. Um, but I would just come back to where I said, you know, if you think the big challenges in, in greening, you know, the energy system, they are global problems. And um, if anyone, you know, we all have a collective interest in driving the cost of these technologies down. And we will all pull on the same critical minerals, the same, you know, supply chain for the equipment to do that. So I think my plea would be, you know, we are better doing this together um, and in consort because um, that will help make that transition, you know, more affordable for all of our customers in all of those countries. So thank you very much for that. Are there particular things you're looking for from the government to do more that would be helpful to you as you move towards the green transition. And as I understand it, Britain is moving um, to have particularly a focus on low carbon hydrogen. Uh, so, I mean, so what are you I mean, looking we're, for? We're, what would help? We're, we're, we, we are primarily at heart a, a networks company. So we'll build the, the, the networks that will enable us to, to green the way we heat and, and transport ourselves around, um, as well as sort of light our homes and factories and power our businesses. Actually, the biggest challenge for us is around um, planning and permitting for, for the infrastructure we need to build. Um, you know, both in the US and in the UK, we probably need, you know, power networks that are three times the size they are today to handle that extra load for electric vehicles for the electrification of heat. And historically, um, it's taken us, you know, you know, typically seven, nine, ten years to build that, most of that time taken up with, with getting planning approval. So, I mean, I know it's not directly relevant to, to the discussions today, but probably the biggest thing we as a company that, that needs to build those networks need is to get, you know, countries to focus on, you know, reforming those planning arrangements and then also just giving us the ability to, to build those networks ahead of, ahead of need. So historically, we've been asked to build just in time. And given the scale of what we've got ahead of us, we're going to have to take some commitments. And we're seeing, I think, positive signs, both signs both in the US Northeast and in the UK, that, that governments and regulators are moving in that direction and understand we need to be able to build significant you know, network infrastructure faster and, and regulatory arrangements need to fund that in anticipation of the demand rather than, you know, waiting for, for you know, the EVs and, and the heat pumps to arrive. So thank you very much for that. In fact, I think that the permitting is a key part of the Net Industrial Act, if I recall correctly. And I saw a piece in the Washington Post today about how slow connect getting connections to the power grid here is in the United States and how that has become a major bottleneck for getting um, for getting green projects online. But let me turn now to Sabina Skerich. Uh, Anno is a major green company, but also does have holdings in PPD, which is uh, primarily fossil fuels. So she's got oversight of both parts of this industry and, of, and a very real oversight of the transition. So what are you looking for from governments? What are the signals that you're getting either from your 
national government or from the commission, uh, and are they working? Are they setting you in, in the right direction, do you think? Well, um, this is very true what you just said. Enab is uh, one of the biggest um, energy company, privately owned energy company in Croatia that basically started from uh, gas trading. Um, and it used to be and still is one of our uh, strongest uh, company that we have within our uh, management framework. But in the last six years, we developed uh, and implement another strategy in order to diversify our business. Exactly one of the reasons for diversifying was the fact that we are tracking really closely all regulations that are um, putting in act uh, in Brussels in for entire EU, uh, EU market. And it was clear 20 years ago even that entire Europe is going towards sustainable, green and clean technologies, clean and green industries, and uh, renewables when we are talking about energy. So that was the major reason why we decided to develop strategy that will basically transit our business towards that direction. So if you ask me how important those uh, signals and uh, guidelines from uh, not just government for us, but also European uh, Commission is, it is extremely important and very helpful for us. So as a private business, what we need, we need to see a vision, we need to understand strategic goals and where is the place where we are all heading. In this sense, um, uh, entire uh, framework, regulatory framework and policies that European Union and European Commission uh, made in last, especially in last uh, five years were really, uh, really, really useful. But what we also need, we need more clear implementing plans mm -hmm. and uh, 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 more, well, to see more, um, how to say that, uh, uh, determination to really cut, for example, administrative burden that we in whole Europe here in Croatia, we do, uh, we can talk especially for Croatia, we do have. And um, a timeline for, for example, from the idea until you put into operation some solar plant is extremely long, especially if we are talking about some bigger projects. Now we are also in a, in a project that includes geothermal energy. And those projects are really renewables. And uh, their importance is more in the fact that they can really um, change and uh, come instead of coal or, for example, gas, when we are talking about producing electricity on a stable way. But those projects, the geothermal projects, are extremely expensive. And they are really complex when we are talking about uh, research and uh, 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 first phases of research. So uh, what we need, we basically need uh, some framework where we can uh, get all the licenses much easier and must, much faster, where we can get our connection on grid, uh, where we can get some support for financing. Uh, and those decisions and those framework, framework for private sector should be really clear, really simple, in order to give the opportunity to private sector to act quickly, fastly, and I'm sure that private investors can be extreme uh, power to, even, uh, to support even faster this green transition. So I'm sure you've also been watching, thanks for putting those those out on the table, because I think the question of financing as well is a big one um, in Europe. Um, in recent meetings there, I certainly heard about how projects that everyone had been talking about last year were still being talked about as future projects, in part because of the financing was being very difficult, especially for renewable energy. Um, but I'm sure you also were watching the IRA and the tax credits that will be coming to companies in the United States. What do you think about that? Has that affected you at all? Or is that something that you see as allowing companies to perhaps 
export to Croatia at below cost, or is it something you'd like to see, tax credits from your own government? How does that affect your view of what, of your situation? Well, uh, sometimes it is really hard to compare uh, United States market and European market because basically we have uh, uh, several different, quite huge differences. But of course, that any kind of uh, financial support that could be provided, especially for big companies like ours, for example, is more than helpful. When we are talking about IRA, uh, we, we did look that quite closely. And of course, that is the question of uh, competitiveness uh, of uh, United States companies in comparison with EU companies. But um, as a private company, uh, we are always for um, cooperation more than um, some kind of competitiveness. Mm -hmm. Why don't we talk about knowledge transfer? Why don't we talk about some uh, joint ventures where both sides can uh, can can get the best mm -hmm. uh, and and affect their goals. Um, last several months, there is quite strong discussion within EU, uh, especially because of the fear that industrial production, especially in those uh, new technologies, green technologies, are going to move out from Europe. Right. And that is also the, the fear that we are going to lose our knowledge. And it is an extremely important issue, and we have to discuss about that issue quite openly and try to find those solutions. And to be honest, European industry is in a, in a way of... Um, in a, some kind of renaissance last <laughs> 10, 10 years, we are trying to bring back our industry produ production uh, within Europe. But in the same time, it is really hard to find that uh, the, the right level because we have lots of obligations that are coming from our uh, orientation towards green. And for example, some other countries do not have that, especially the countries that are not uh, members of EU. A last example you have in petrochemical industry. In Europe, basically, all petrochemical industry during this time of high gas prices were stopped with their, with their operations. And European market was flooded with uh, uh, products from Africa, Turkey, and other countries that do not have such high level of, for example, CO2 emission um, uh, uh, burden and other stuff. So from our point of view, it is always better to sit and to talk quite openly about all the questions and try, try to find the best way how to use um, from both sides what both sides can give. And, you know, so that both sides, United States, European Union, Great Britain can prosper. Because we do have entire Asia as a huge market and huge, um, and there are lots of uh, new players, and they're also really fast in their development. So we all have to find some way how to, let me say, live, live together and prosper together in our ideas. Good, thank you. Um, let me turn now to our last panelist, and let me also remind the audience to get those questions in and uh, go to the mic if you're inclined. Um, so one of the areas where there's been a lot of discussion within the EU, and I think we will probably see some of it in the United States as well, is the differences within the EU over state aid. And how much should there be new, new monies in response to uh, the Inflation Reduction Act, or do you just loosen the rules, which have been loosened a little bit for renewable energies? Um, and also the discussion about nuclear. Um, is this, how green is nuclear? Should it be included in renewable targets? And uh, Ambassador Tsadare, I wonder if you could provide us with a perspective from Hungary on these issues. Thank you very much and many thanks for the invitation. I think it's a very timely uh, exchange of views. Uh, <clears throat> first on the nuclear, I, it, you're right, there was a very important debate about uh, what could become uh, the part of the energy mix of the member states. Uh, while we are entering <clears throat> the green transition. We have a very strong commitment that we have to reach 
carbon neutrality by 2050. And th this will be a, a tough uh, game if you want to maintain your competitiveness and, and, and uh, the affordability of your uh, energy supplies, uh, but still uh, moving towards uh, carbon neutrality, uh, then it's inevitable that you have to have, for example, nuclear as part of your energy mix. Mm -hmm. And this debate at the end of the day, because there were uh, quite a number of uh, EU member states who are pro-nuclear, I mean, countries who are for the peaceful use of, of nuclear power for energy generation. Uh, with the leadership of France, we could achieve a good uh, result in this debate. And now uh, nuclear is a legitimate part. Without nuclear, we wouldn't be able to reach the goals that we set uh, by 2050. Uh, and we also think that it's it's part of your sovereignty, basically, to to define what is part of your energy mix and what are the proportions within them. So now there's nuclear, there is uh, gas as a transitional uh, source, uh, also inevitable, and uh, of course the renewables. In that respect, uh, we have made a lot of progress, but there is still a lot to do, of course. Now, state aid, <clears throat> state aid is legitimate uh, between some some limits, with some limits. Uh, uh, I think both both the U.S. and the EU uh, has uh, rules for uh, state aid uh, for different types of investments. Uh, the problem is if this uh, becomes an overwhelming solution, and if this is uh, uh, making a competition between the different parties uh, unbalanced, imbalanced. So in that respect, I think it's important that we all follow the WTO rules <clears throat> and um, we, we, we do something uh, together <clears throat> for the IRA, for example. <clears throat> it is not beneficial for Europe. It is in the interest of the US to have the IRA. But I think we have to talk more. The Commission has to talk more to the US administration to find some solutions, because if we go uh, along this, uh, this path, then it will become more controversial, the relationship between the US and the EU, and, and we will have more trouble. Uh, we understand the interests on both sides, but I think we have to find a solution for this. Thank you. So let me turn to you, Miguel, um, about this uh, last point, because we do have a dialogue going on now, a transparency, clean energy transparency incentives dialogue. But I think Ambassador Sarte has raised a point of um, how similar we are or different we are. are we uh, Is the U.S. going and, and funding things that will then make Europe's um, industry less competitive? Perhaps not within Europe so much, but globally. And the other thing that is coming down the pike at us, hmm. I think actually the transition phase has now started, is CBAM carbon border adjustment mechanism. Do you see that as part of industrial policy in, in Europe? And how do you think it will avoid um, disadvantaging uh, partners like the United States who don't have a carbon price, for example? I, I mean, I, first of all, I would like to say that, I mean, we have been speaking now for some minutes, but we have not yet mentioned the word China. That's true. And I think that it's very important <laughs> I mean, not to present the discussions we're having today as an issue, you know, between the U.S. or the EU, is there, you know, a competition? I mean, I think we need to look at the, at the, at the big picture. And, you know, Chinese uh, products, uh, you know, I mean, they have been somehow, you know, subsidized. I mean, the state has been quite present for, uh, for, for some time. So this, you know, I'm coming back to this idea that, you know, we need to work together with like-minded partners to ensure that we have uh, that we have uh, similar similar rules. Now, in terms of uh, of uh, competitiveness of uh, of the industry, I mean, there are many many factors. You know, if it was so easy, uh, you know, with uh, with uh, with public policy to ensure that an economy is uh, is competitive, I mean, we will all be very happy. But I mean, as I said, there are different factors. There might be different incentives, different regulatory tools to uh, to try to incentivize. Uh, this um, uh, this uh, this competitiveness, but I would like to come back also to a point that you know Ambassador uh, was mentioning. I mean, we are committed to this net zero path. Yeah. It is not going to be easy, and we need to deploy 
all the different tools. Now, it's a bit of, you know, funny discussion to say, I mean, is this policy a climate policy? Is it an industrial policy? Because today, energy issues and climate issues, they are at the core of the economic, of the economic discussion. I mean, I think for us, CBAM is a very important tool. I mean, we have now reached an agreement at the Council with the Member States and at the Parliament. We are now in this transition period that will last until 2025. And we would like to work with other countries in the world, uh, you know, for our own implementation, but also, you know, going forward in setting these rules that would allow, I mean, actually trade to happen in a way, because CBAM is not discriminatory. Uh, in a way that, you know, leads to this climate transition and, you know, to better industrial production. I mean, we need to go, as, you know, the other panelists say, on this together. So let me ask, um, let me ask Steve Smith to expound a little bit on um, the UK as, you know, a like-minded country. Mm. Um, CBAM will affect you as a third country now, not as one of the member states, but you do have some carbon pricing. So what are you expecting over the next couple of years in terms of, and maybe, maybe National Grid is not on the front lines with the EU, but what are you expecting vis-a-vis -vis energy policy and the transition um, in the UK vis-a-vis -vis the EU? And how do you see it playing out with the U.S. as well? I, s yeah, I mean, I, mean, I think, as, as has been said, with the crisis in Ukraine and the impact on, on gas prices, I think, you know, it's, it's helpfully, you know, reinforced, um, you know, the dependencies between, you know, Britain and the EU in, in terms of our energy security. I mean, we are heavily um, interconnected with mainland Europe, both on the gas and electric side. And, you know, I think it's increasingly likely that there will be a large, you know, offshore electric grid um, that, that helps, you know, both sides of that relationship balance. So I think it's driven greater cooperation and a greater understanding of the need, you know, for us to work together, which had been there for many years. Um, you know, sadly, Brexit, you know, maybe led to a bit of a hiatus, but I think it reinforced that need. I mean, mm. we have been shipping vast quantities of, of LNG into Europe to, to, to help. And, you know, Europe has, has moved a lot of electrons our way as well to, to, to help us. So I think you will see greater physical ties, um, you know, and there are many already between uh, the UK and the EU. And, and look, on, on the, the US point, there are many things in the IRA. Um, there are technologies that we need for the transition. I mean, you mentioned hydrogen. Nobody is yet able to produce hydrogen at scale from green electricity. You know, some of the incentives that are in place through the IRA should really drive the scaling of that, those industrial processes. And hopefully, if, if U.S. companies can crack that, and, and certainly something we're involved in in the U.S. Northeast, then to the point about, you know, knowledge share and transfer, that's that's a benefit to the rest of the world because, you know, there are many other countries that will need that as part of their solution to the to the transition. So, again, I come back to what I said before. I think, you know, the watchword should be, you know, cooperation and working together because, you know, there are collective problems for us to solve. And if we want to have security and reliability, then um, more interconnection. I mean, we are interconnected physically with the U.S. as well because much of that gas we shipped to Europe came from came from the U.S. by boat. So I think we just need to remember that our, our energy systems are intertwined, um, and that should foster more more cooperation um, and you know less of a sense that this is zero sum. Right. So, but let me go back to Miguel's comment about China, because I think what you're saying about energy flows. Uh, makes a lot of sense. But I wanted to ask you about, I mean, obviously, China manufactures a ton of chips. Um, a lot of, they provide a lot of critical uh, raw materials and, and rare minerals um, that are part of an energy system and certainly of a grid. Um, how are you seeing competitiveness vis-a-vis -vis China? What do you need to do to ensure that um, your system is resilient despite China's domination of some of those components? Um, well, I think, I think COVID made 
every large multinational company think hard about its supply chain. So China is one aspect of that, but just more generally, you know, that just made everyone realize that you, you needed to understand not just where your you know major components were coming from, but but then the things that were intrinsic in, in some of those components as well. So I think all of us are thinking hard about our supply chains and and, and how resilient they are. And you know, in the electric sector, I mean, as I said, we're just going to need you know much much more of, of all of the basic inputs. Um, so we are going to need to see a, a huge increase in manufacturing capacity for for transformers, for cables, for everything like that, because every country is going to need to you know dramatically increase the size of its size of its network so i think again it, it speaks to you know that need for for cooperation and to make sure that you know we are able to manufacture those components that we will all need um you know where we are comfortable sourcing them um and let me go with the same question basically to sabina skerich um as you look at the multitude of energy projects that you're putting together, clearly you have a need for some of the same things that we were just talking about. And um, I think that Steve's observation about the need for enhanced manufacturing capabilities uh, for these material, not just the materials, but also things like cables, electrolyzers, wind turbines, et cetera, all those types of things. What is your view of the need for that, the role that China, which has been very active in Central and Eastern Europe over the years, uh, what's your view of what of the reliance on China and what should be done about it, if anything? Well, I think that uh, Europe has lesson learned during the COVID time, as uh, uh, Mr. Smith rightly said. Uh, we were all witnessing a situation where our supply chains were totally broken and basically entire, U entire Europe was affected uh, with the lack of not just um, some complex resources for some complex industry, but also with some basic, uh, basic production. And I think it was, um, it was quite shocking experience for the Europe as well. From our point of view, it looks that a European Commission through uh, net, uh, net Zero uh, Industry Act is actually trying to set up the platform in order to, when I was talking before, in order to bring back uh, production. Uh, you rightly said uh, on the very beginning that it is not just a question of affordability. We are basically here talking in Europe, but also US as well, is basically talking about three major pillars. We have to talk about sustainability. We have to talk, we have to talk about uh, the secure uh, supply, not just energy, but all primary sources. And we also have to, to talk about sustainability. So sometimes it's really hard to make peace between those uh, three pillars. But uh, from our point of view, it is from out of huge importance to set up such uh, such scene with all the um, uh, possible help could be made in order to 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 make a revival of industrial production in Europe, um, not just uh, uh, the the old industries, but more important these new industries, for example. Uh, solar panels and uh, everything what you need in order to to put a solar panel on some roof, for example, uh, almost 90% of those uh, of those products are basically made in China. So, looking from that aspect, European Union needs some strong partner, and this is uh, from my point of view reason more to uh, make. Um, some strong alliance with uh, United States, for example, and to bring more um, efforts into finding points of aligning between um, different uh, uh, policies that are implementing not only in European Union, but also in the United States. Because from, from our point of view, we have the same, uh, I would say we have the same problems and we have the same challenges. So we have to find a way how to 
how to build our competitiveness for a new for new decade, new 20 years, new 30 years. So I'm going to go to uh, Ambassador Tsaite for a last question there, but then I'm going to come back to Steve and Sabina and ask them for the one thing that they would like from a government to make sure that their investments succeed. Um, and then, Miguel, you're going to get the last word. Uh, so you can defend what against what they say or promise them that it's coming. Not Steve, exactly. But, um, but Ambassador, uh, two questions for you. Um, you mentioned earlier that the IRA kind of lays a, a, puts forward a framework where if we continue, and I may have misunderstood you, if we continue in that direction, which is it's good for the US but not for Europe so much, um, there could be greater US-EU tensions. And others here have placed a big emphasis on cooperation. So I wondered if you'd expand on how you see this being um, an irritant in the relationship. And then you also mentioned sovereignty as part of uh, how a government approaches its energy decisions. Um, but there's also the quality that has been brought up a couple of times in this panel and others uh, about resilience. And I wonder if there's how Hungary sees the need and the steps to be taken to make its energy system resilient from countries that might not be as, as friendly or at least from disruptions of any kind. And we With this last just question, you open a huge, a huge. I know, huge and we only have system. two minutes, so go ahead. I will try to minimize my. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Intervention, uh, yeah. I mean, uh, on the first one, uh, we we always said that antagonism. <clears throat> there is no antagonism between competition and cooperation, and I think that's that's the baseline. So we have a lot of common interests between the EU and the US, uh, especially if you look at the big global uh, 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 markets. Uh, the two have to work together, and in that respect, uh, I mentioned the IRA, which was, uh, uh, which is not a. Uh, a very helpful instrument in this cooperation, but we are we still believe in uh, intra-industrial and inter-industrial cooperation, and we are sure that we can only achieve the climate goals if uh, the U.S. and the EU work together and not against each other. I know we know that it's uh, it's not easy because it's a very complex uh, trade and industrial regulation issue, but uh, but we have to continue uh, along that uh, uh, path. The other thing, uh, resilience. Yes, we have a, a legacy uh, in Central Europe with a lot of uh, exposure, for example, to Russian energy supplies. And we have done a lot for, for the sake of diversification in the past 10, 15 years. We have connected uh, our gas pipelines to the neighboring countries. Uh, we have started a new uh, uh, nuclear plant uh, construction and uh, so on and so forth. But now, uh, with this war in our back, it's even more difficult to secure the supplies. And everybody is fighting to get uh, secure supplies of different types of energy sources. So we hope that uh, with the diversification activities, we will be able to have more sources and more routes uh, to get uh, secured and affordable uh, gas, oil, and nuclear fuel uh, parts uh, supplies. But but this is, again, a, a difficult way. And in the EU, we discussed a lot about uh, possibilities, how we can achieve this goal. But it will take some time. But we will do our best to diversify and make it more resilient. Thank you very much. So let me go to Steve. What's the one thing that you would like to see governments do to help you uh, be more resilient and go through the transition? I, I've already said it, just um, reform permitting planning. We, we need to be able to build electric infrastructure at pace, you know, on, on a scale we haven't in a long time. And and I think that's a common problem across the EU, the UK and the US. Um, and, and we need to work collectively on how we, how we fix that so that we, uh, otherwise, <coughs> as I said, if the networks aren't there, then they will become the bottleneck. Sabina, last word from you. The same question. Thank you. I must agree with uh, with uh, uh, Mr. Smith. Um, the same the same is from our side. Less complicated permitting procedures that takes less time than it is today. And of course, if I can choose some effective financial framework with guarantee with guarantees with 
tax policies and uh, pro financial products that could support that intensive financial and investment cycle. So, Miguel, let me ask you, the Net Zero Act, Critical Materials Act, uh, Minerals, Raw Materials Act, both have permitting issue, limits on permitting, but it, for very specific projects, strategic projects, is this the beginning of the EU attacking this problem that they've laid out here for permitting mm. generally, or what do you think? Yes, I think, I mean, we have been addressing this issue for a very long time, but we have also learned with the, with the events that unfolded in 2021 and 2022 that, you know, infrastructure and investments can be deployed very quickly. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I think the LNG terminals that were delivered in the northwestern region in the, in the EU are a good proof of that. Uh, we have passed uh, emergency regulations for, uh, for permitting. I agree very much that we need to now do a big effort on grids to be able to absorb all the new renewables that will come, but also the electric cars, the heat pumps, the electrification of the economy. And for that, it is very important that we cut red tape, that we get the financial incentives right, and that we have clear, predictable, stable regulation. So thank you very much for that. I think that we have also to see that type of uh, reform in the United States. So Indeed. we'll see what happens with that. But thank you to our panelists. Thanks very much for joining us here today. Um, and thanks very much to the audience for joining us as well. And to Miguel for actually being here in person. But I look forward uh, someday to seeing all of you, everyone in person. Thank you. So thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.